testing the mic. Okay, we're good. Hi friends, and welcome back for part 18. The full Eiko Aizawa series playlist is linked below in the description. And if you've been wondering why I've been gone from this series for so long, it's because I've been really focusing on the writing of it. During the time I haven't been uploading chapters, I've written out the next seven or so chapters and made a very detailed long-term plotline. Now that I've done that, we can really get rolling again. So buckle up. Mike! You yelled. It shook the house in a strange reversal of roles. What? Mike popped his head around the corner to peer into the living room. You stood with your arms crossed, looking, well, cross. You came to help take care of Dad, didn't you? Your point? My point is that you should be here, making sure he follows Recovery Girl's instructions. You pointed accusingly at Dad, who was patiently struggling, and succeeding, to put on boots without hands. She did say you should be in bed for at least two weeks, Mike agreed, walking over. Aizawa sighed tiredly behind the mummy-like swath of bandages. I have work to do, and I'm sufficiently healed. Well, Mike shrugged, there's no stopping him. You glared. You're giving up that easily? This is only after years of dealing with Aizawa's attitude towards doctor's advice, Mike defended himself. Eko. Aizawa addressed you and you could hear a hint of irritation in his voice. I understand your concern, but there is work that needs to be done. I am taking care to avoid overexerting myself. Can you accept that? You looked down at him. He must be looking at you because his face was at the right angle. But you couldn't see his eyes behind his bandages. You hesitated. Could you accept that? No, you answered with cold honesty. Aizawa. He stiffened at your use of his formal name. You covered up all your work injuries, and you lied that you could take all the villains at the USJ. And you still want me to trust you? Aizawa remained frozen. I see. The two words sounded so unmoved. For once, you hated Aizawa's impenetrable rationality. Tell me this. You crouched to look straight into his bandaged face. If you could go back in time, would you still lie to me? Aizawa stared back. You glowered as the silence stretched on. Yes, he murmured softly. You almost couldn't believe it. Was he for real? Telling you to your face that he would lie all over again, given the chance? You stumbled back, tears of betrayal welling in your eyes. I can't stand this. I... I need to go. Eiko, wait. Aizawa staggered to his feet. His struggle to move somehow made you even madder. You ran, slamming the front door as your feet took you away from the house. Your ragged breathing and feet hitting the pavement made his distant voice easy to ignore. Aizawa's point of view. It hurt more than he expected. The betrayal in your eyes felt worse than any injury he'd ever gotten from hero work. Why won't she understand? Mike looked unimpressed. Understand what? Aizawa tried to pace, but had to lean back against the wall when his body didn't cooperate. She's still a kid, and I'm her father. Protecting her is my top priority. Well, she depends on you, and you almost died. Makes sense that she feels shaken, don't you think? I wasn't going to die, Aizawa growled. She doesn't seem so sure, Mike mused aloud. You knew when you entered that fight that the outcome was uncertain. You never take risks with any lives except your own, and Aiko's catching on to that. Stop making me sound like some sort of martyr, Aizawa snapped. I've taken down thousands of villains over the years. Taking down thirty more wasn't impossible. Keeping Aiko out of it was the rational way to ensure her safety. He abruptly headed for the door. Where are you going? Mike asked. To teach my class. What about Aiko? She'd better be there, Aizawa snarled. Mike sighed, stubborn as ever. Aizawa entered the classroom just before the first bell. Your seat was empty. He glowered. You were so grounded. He pushed aside his nagging worry 
and focused on explaining the upcoming sports festival to his class. When you still hadn't shown up after an hour, he excused himself and headed to the break room. Midnight was sitting at the table painting her nails. Aizawa managed to drop his phone on the table next to her. Kayama, I need you to send some texts. She pouted. My nails aren't dry yet. Aizawa looked at her with thinning patience, brandishing his bandage-encased arms. That must be inconvenient, he said sarcastically. She picked up the phone with a sigh. All right, fine. Who do you want me to message? Your point of view, an hour earlier. You ran. You didn't think about where you were going. The entire area felt familiar to you, every road and back street. As you ran through an alley, Shinso biked past the alley entrance. He saw you and put on the brakes. Eiko? He wore his school uniform, obviously on his way to UA. He frowned, trying to figure out why you were running. You whirled and ran the opposite direction, back down the alley. Sorry, Shinso, you thought, breathing raggedly. Shinso's bike suddenly whipped in front of you, sending up a spray of gravel as it effectively blocked your way. Talk to me, Eiko. Not now, you panted, switching direction. You suddenly experienced a floaty, weightless sensation as control of your body was lifted away. Your blood ran hot and cold in shock. Shinso, who had never let you feel his power even once, had just brainwashed you. And he was powerful. You could finally feel it. He came into view, his eyes searching your face with intensity. What's wrong, Eiko? I had a fight with Aizawa. Your voice came out in a robotic monotone. Shinso hesitated, regret settling into his eyes. Control of your body came crashing back and you stumbled. I'm sorry, Shinso said, already walking away. I mistook the situation for an emergency. I can see now that it was a personal issue, and you didn't want to talk. You sank to your knees, stunned. He kept walking. Wait, you called weakly. He stopped, turning his head slightly so that you could see the contours of his face in the gray light. Hitoshi, don't go. I may have been running, but the truth is, I don't want to be alone right now. You laughed. I sound pathetic. Shinso stood frozen. Less pathetic than a guy who uses his power on his friend. That was kind of surprising, you admitted, but it did kind of help me snap out of it, so I'll let it go. But you owe me salmon sushi. Shinso turned to face you, eyebrows raised in disbelief. That's all. Expensive salmon sushi, you emphasized. After a long moment, Shinso grinned dryly. Remember how they accused us of ditching class when we were in primary school? You mean our good friends, Sano and Kai? You winced at the memory. Shinso's grin turned sly. Wanna live up to that accusation today? You refrained from showing your surprise. Shinso, the perfect student, was suggesting ditching. This was too good to miss. He offered his hand to help you to your feet, and you took it. Why not? You smiled. You rode on Shinso's handlebars. The wind lifted your hair and your mood. Before long, Shinso was paying for expensive, very expensive, sushi. That was fast, you commented. I only demanded this like ten minutes ago. I don't know what your interest rates are, Shinso deadpanned, so I thought it best to pay my debt quickly. Very wise of you, you laughed. <laughs> so, Shinso leaned forward across the table. The light in his purple eyes focused on you. No one else ever looked at you in quite that way. Um, sorry, you blinked. What did you say? He studied you. You still don't want to talk about it? No, really, I didn't hear you, you reddened. He looked thoughtful and carefully repeated. I asked why you'd gotten in a fight with Aizawa. Oh, you looked away gloomily. It took a while to explain, mostly because you didn't quite understand your own feelings. Shinso just nodded softly and looked thoughtful the entire time. 
He was more of a sounding board than anything else. It helped you get all your thoughts out. Am I... am I crazy, Shinso? No, he replied immediately. I mean, you explained. He was protecting me. I should be grateful. I, I know that. And yet, I'm so angry. Don't dismiss your feelings. Shinso's steady gaze met yours. Even if you don't understand yourself, there's a valid reason for all your emotions. Take time to sort it out. I... I guess that's possible. You felt lighter just from having someone validate you. Shinso hesitated. Would you like my opinion? You braced yourself. Sure. You're only mad at Aizawa because you care about him. You need to find a way to reconcile. It's too important to you. You stared. Why do I feel like you're right? You sighed. Shinso grinned wryly. It's easier to see things clearly when you're on the outside. You raised an eyebrow. So that's the secret? That. And. Shinso tilted his head as a thought occurred to him. I am a genius. You laughed, flicking his nose. There's that Hitoshi Shinso arrogance right on schedule. He sly smiled, looking unruffled and relaxed, despite your flick to his face. His phone vibrated on the table. Shinso scanned the message on the screen, and his smile vanished. It's Aizawa, asking if I've seen you. His frown deepened. He must be worried. You sighed. You'd hoped to have more time before having to talk, but... Time to face this. Can I borrow your phone? Shinso nodded as you got up. You went outside to talk, leaving Shinso in the restaurant. Aizawa picked up almost immediately. Shinso, have you- It's me, you interrupted. There was a long pause, then- You are so grounded. You laughed. What's so funny? It's just that I understand, you chuckled. You're mad because I made you worry. Same reason I got mad at you. There was another long pause. Cheeky problem, child. Aizawa muttered without his usual bite. Where are you? Downtown, at the sushi place. Figured I'd drown my troubles in soy sauce. You're ridiculous, kid. But you love me, don't you? You weren't sure where that had come from. Aizawa wasn't the kind of parent to share affection openly. You grimaced. Aizawa's voice came through the phone gruffly. You know I do, kid. A slow smile spread across your face. For the record, I still haven't forgiven you for hiding your injuries, or for nearly getting yourself killed, but I love you too. Aizawa was speechless on the other end. You smirked. I, I wasn't going to die, irrational kid. I'll make sure you don't. It's not a kid's job to worry about their dad. And you think it's your job to do everything alone? You sound like Mike and Kayama. So everyone agrees with me. What a coincidence. You've made your point. I saw a side. For your peace of mind, I promise not to hide any more injuries from you. I'm more of a survivor than you think. But Eiko, I am your father. And a pro hero. In the end, like it or not, I'll do whatever I must. Do you understand? You hesitated, thinking. He wasn't going to hide his injuries anymore. That was a step forward. You didn't like the rest of what he said. But he was just that kind of person. The kind to put others first, even if everyone else thought he was scary and heartless. The kind who loved you deeply, even if it was hard for him to say. The kind of dad who you'd never dreamed you could deserve. Your fingers tightened around the phone. Okay, Dad. I understand. Good. And Eiko, you're still in trouble for ditching. Still grounded? So much for your plans to rock out at Jiro's later today. Aizawa would probably have you do extra homework. I understand, you sighed. From an alleyway, two figures in hoodies watched the cat girl talk on the phone. 
One kept his hands loosely by his sides, careful not to touch anything. The other, who was better positioned to watch, narrowed his lavender-blue eyes, watching the girl intently. A boy emerged from the restaurant, tall and lanky with a strong jaw, masculine eyebrows, and casually messed lavender hair that seemed to defy gravity. The boy glanced around himself. It was still a shock, seeing him grown up. Hitoshi. Katsumi stared intently, resolving to find a way to get his son back from this corrupt society. Hitoshi scanned his surroundings nonchalantly, as though sensing that someone was watching. Finding no one except the cat girl, he waited for her to finish her call before walking over to talk to her. When is Slasher getting here? Shigaraki demanded in a rough whisper. He's already here, Katsumi noted quietly. His eyes narrowed. Slasher had better follow the program. Your point of view. You were hanging up just as Shinso approached. How'd it go? He asked with a keen glance. You opened your mouth to answer but paused as your cat ears picked up a slight sound that seemed out of place. You realized what was odd as soon as you focused. Hitoshi had two sets of footsteps. Your eyes widened. Hitoshi, look out! You yelled, diving for him. You were too slow. Hitoshi stumbled as an invisible force attacked. He dipped his chin down and pulled on something angrily, trying to break free of a chokehold. You were already running to help him, but the invisible villain was fast. They pulled the choking Hitoshi back into the sushi place in a blur of speed. Let him go, you snarled, claws extending as you dashed forward. You got inside just in time to watch Hitoshi get thrown into a wall. Customers screamed and knocked over their chairs in their haste to vacate tables. You focused amid all the sounds. You knew the attacker's footsteps. There. You dashed forward, snarling as you attacked. You missed, claws slashing harmlessly into the wall, but your second slash connected with something, like metal on metal. The attacker had their own claws. They added an identical slash of claw marks into the wall next to you. It missed you by a long shot. What were they playing at? Your senses honed in on their movements as you got better at recognizing their specific footfalls, breathing patterns, and even the faint sound of their inhuman heartbeat. They ran away from you, towards the crowd of screaming people who were trying to get to the door. Oh no you don't! You yelled, sprinting in fluid chase before the villain could hurt anyone. You managed to reach them, right as they reached the crowd. But a man in a suit got grazed across the chest of his expensive-looking cream-white shirt. He fell backwards on his butt in his haste to get away. The invisible villain fell into a frenzy, slashing with no apparent pattern. They wrecked tables, shattered a window, and scratched a few people despite your efforts to stay right on their tail and take them down. Then, as suddenly as they had appeared, they vanished. You froze, sniffing. They were no longer in the room. You were certain. You growled in frustration. The restaurant lay in shambles. Claw marks gouged narrow trenches into the walls and tables and sliced thinner materials into ribbons. Everything was overturned, the floor littered with shattered dishes and the glass from the demolished window. And all that wasted sushi. Hardly fair that people hadn't gotten to eat their food. You sighed, retracting your claws and relaxing. Hitoshi climbed to his feet, using the wall for support. People were still trying to evacuate, not seeming to realize that the villain had left. The businessman whose shirt had gotten slashed stared up at you with wide eyes. You checked, but it seemed that the villain's slash hadn't actually grazed his skin. What a relief. Are you all right, sir? You offered your hand to help him up. His eyes widened even further, and he scurried backwards desperately, begging for his life. You blinked, hand still outstretched to help him. He was looking at you with fear. Your hand dropped to your side, and you looked around the room. Every time you met someone's eyes, they flinched and renewed their efforts to elbow through the door. Didn't they know that the villain was gone? Had they even noticed the invisible villain? What had your actions looked like to them? 
Surely they didn't think. Sirens sounded in the distance. As you stood in shock, a muscular prohero crashed into the room. He fixed his eyes on you with clear resolve. No, you've got it wrong. You backed away, hands up in surrender. I'm not a villain. The hero continued advancing. Your heel hit the wall and you realized that you were backed into a corner. The pro-hero stepped forward loomingly. Behind him, Shinso's voice ordered, Wait. Why? The hero growled, and his eyes went blank. You stared in horror. Hitoshi let him go! That's a pro-hero! Not until the police get here, Shinso snapped. Another pro-hero missled in through the shattered window, slamming you into the wall by your throat. Ow, you whimpered, black spots edging into your vision. The noisy world sounded far away. You could faintly hear a desperate Shinso shouting your name. You could faintly hear the crowd cheering as you were taken down. And then everything went dark. Aizawa's point of view, minutes earlier. Midnight lowered the phone once Eiko hung up. Do you need my hands for anything else, Eraser? No, I'm fine. Thanks, Kayama. All right, see you around. Midnight smirked at him playfully. She passed Mike on her way out. Mike strode into the teacher's lounge, sipping a soda. For a while, there was silence except for the faint sounds of news reports from the TV. Aizawa trusted Shinso and you to get back safely, so he turned his attention to working through some papers he'd put in a filing box. It was irritatingly hard to focus, though, with the way Mike kept throwing nervous glances at him. What is it, Mike? He growled without looking up. Shoda! Mike was serious, for once. Aizawa felt a sense of misgiving. Don't you want to talk about it? About what the Warpgate villain said? Aizawa froze. It had happened right before he'd lost consciousness in the USJ fight. Part of him had wondered if he'd really heard it. Do you think, Mike continued hesitantly, it could be... Shirakumo, Aizawa asked harshly. Mike's eyes widened. In all the years since UA, Aizawa had never said their friend's name again. Not once. It doesn't seem possible. Aizawa gritted his teeth. You've always wanted me to say how I feel, Mike. His eyes flashed red. I'll tell you how I feel. I don't know whether the villain said that to mess with us, or whether they really did change Shirakumo. Either way, I'll find who is responsible, and they will regret it to their last breath. His hair swirled weightlessly above his murderous expression. Mike stared at the inferno of calm rage in Aizawa's red eyes. Shoda, Mike thought, heart sinking. Is this what you've been keeping in? Shoda, I've been thinking about how Shirakumo... Quiet, Aizawa interrupted, eyes narrowing. No, really, shut up, Aizawa snapped, and turn up the TV volume. Startled, Mike clicked up the volume. Villain incident at Kyoto Sushi. Pro-hero Death Arms has apprehended the attacker. The camera view showed the police loading someone into a vehicle while the hero Death Arms chatted with the officers. It was impossible to see who they'd arrested until some of the officers moved slightly, revealing an unconscious villain they'd loaded into the car. A girl with messy dark hair. Mike's face blanched white. Aizawa was already out the door. Shoda! Mike yelled, wait, I'll drive! Fine, Aizawa snapped, step on it. In a lower voice, he muttered, you've really outdone yourself this time, problem child. They left in a screech of tires. For once, Aizawa did not criticize Mike's driving. There's part 18, part 19 coming soon. Bye!